Bark Invest on the latest build of FSD. Don't mind if I do. While we have Daniel on as well, and we'll, we'll get Nick's take here because I think he's got a different side. We're, <laughs> uh, well, you know, we're going to transition to Tesla, electric vehicles, all of this. Everyone's talking about the newest update. You guys both drive Teslas. What's What's been your experience with the the recent update? Sure. Maybe I can go first, Nick, and then... Yeah, you go. I think you have a more recent data point than me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so my, my car is operating in version 12.3.3, which I believe is the most up-to-date software. Um, I was extremely impressed by this. It's uh, very good on non-highways, so tough intersections, lights on, lights off, pedestrians crossing right or left. I even saw on Twitter... Um, I believe it, it interprets hand signals from pedestrians, which is... No, no, Daniel, only your experience. Okay. Have, okay. Everyone can look at Twitter. What's okay. your experience? My experience is it's extremely good. I've probably driven maybe close to 20 hours using it. A couple of disengagements uh, on highway. My off-highway disengagements have been a bit uncomfortably close to the curb. I probably didn't need to disengage, but I didn't want to rack up a bill of having to get my tires fixed or <laughs> prevent any damage yeah, some, to them. So. Some yeah. hubcaps. Hubcaps, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, key takeaway, I suppose, is it's pretty impressive. I certainly don't think it's perfect yet. A couple of areas of improvement, but um, yeah, d- definitely noticeably different than previous versions. Common feedback. In fact, I'd say universal feedback. Latest build of FSD, trained end-to-end on video. Everyone is using it. Saying things like, feels different, seems intelligent, very human-like. This is an extremely positive sign for Tesla. This is entirely new, rebuilt, and it's behaving differently, better, and more naturally. I even heard people discussing the fact that while in the vehicle, their partner previously would know who was driving, e.g. the human or the software, now cannot tell. I'd be curious right. to know your... Yeah, I thought yeah. I've and, and only Nick, used why you, it... Why do you hate it? Yeah. <laughs> I've, only, I've only used it once, and I was actually in the car with you, Daniel. Yeah. I think it was, you know, in that short period... It felt like it was handling turns in the city of St. Pete better than it had before. Mm -hmm. But my experience having used FSD over many different versions is, you know, there's still uh, corner cases that make me as a driver feel a bit uncomfortable. And, you know, when I'm driving, it's in most cases just easier for me to do it myself than have to be yeah. hyper aware of, you know, when is this going to freak out on me? Um, I actually, I do love it for highway use. I think it's great on the mm-hmm. highway. Um, you know, just driving in a straight line, it's very good at, um, it's more so, you know, I'm not going to turn it on to go down the street for groceries. It's just not worth the time and energy you have to put in, even though that's counterintuitive to its purpose, right? It's yeah. supposed to feel uh, and it might just be, a, I think, maybe personal to me. Mm-hmm. Um, I just feel a bit more comfortable having the control. Um, you know, if I'm going to wreck the car, I'd rather it be on <laughs> to me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> to you yeah, I would rather it be on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'd rather it be on me than, than the car because then I would hold some some a grudge against it. Yeah. I, I, All right. Yeah. Okay. I was just going to say one. Go ahead, Sam. Yeah, go ahead, Daniel. I was going to say one last point too on it is that I felt like in certain instances, if like I'm somewhat under time pressure, I would personally drive because under the speed limits, of course. But (laughs) it just uh, I don't know. I feel like sometimes it waits a bit long on stop signs too. Clearly, still in its grandma phase, to be expected. As FSD becomes increasingly confident of its capabilities in different situations, it will become more aggressive, faster, more efficient, and so on. But at this point in time, obviously, has to err on the side of being cautious because the risk of being overconfident and wrong is a collision um more than necessary got it all right but that's this is just the the segue the real thing i want to talk about there's a few things happening that i think are changing the landscape i'd say for electric vehicles um and i think we're entering this new era where it's like you know the last 10 years 12 years time flies has been defined by battery cost declines because this was a key enabling factor, right? The battery is the single largest cost component of the car. So if you go back and you see battery prices in 2012, if you wanted a 300 mile range EV, it was cost prohibitive, right? So it's like in the US, there's no greater than 300 mile range EV. And then in 2016, I think you got the Model S and it was like over a hundred thousand 
then Model 3 and Y come out, and now 300-mile range EV is 50000 You look at battery costs today, right? They're roughly $60 per kilowatt hour for lithium iron phosphate. You have people making extremely inexpensive vehicles in China. I think it's possible. Obviously, it's extremely difficult to do. But I think we're at the point with battery cost declines where it's no longer the, you know, the limiting factor here, the gatekeeper. We should have affordable, acceptable range EVs in the next couple of years. And so I think that's... So first of all, if only we could have known that battery costs would decline predictably. Oh, wait, they did. And we did. And we could have. And some people did. This is going to go down as one of the biggest missteps in corporate history, how legacy automotive manufacturers did not see the writing on the wall for the internal combustion engine vehicle. A decade ago, it's obvious, battery costs are declining. They're too expensive now for most people, but the costs are declining. What happens if we run that forward and look at those cost declines? And as the guys on our point out, we're now at a point where the battery costs are not really the limiting factor. Don't get me wrong. They're still the most expensive thing in the vehicle and costs are still declining. But it's now possible to make a compelling electric vehicle with great range that's affordable to many consumers. And Tesla's next generation modular manufacturing system for their new vehicle platform is going to drive further costs out. When they presented this, call it about a year ago, over time they believe they can drive 50% of the cost out, half the cost. At that point, the vast majority of consumers, not just those with a bit of cash to spend, but the vast majority will be able to afford a compelling electric vehicle. With companies like Ford, General Motors, and many others pulling back and slowing down their EV plans, this just sets Tesla up for even greater dominance, especially in the United States. That's going to change the dynamics ahead. At the same time, you know, what do you have? You've had huge investment in battery capacity. Um, and now you have traditional automakers who are kind of pumping the brakes, saying they're, they're going to focus on hybrid, delay some EV projects. And so you, you have the chance where you could have battery cost declines come down even faster than would otherwise be the case, at least for a short period of time because of an oversupply. And so it's like, I really think these companies that are going to focus on hybrid are going to actually make it better for the pure play companies who are willing to push through on their investment for pure battery electric. And you're, I feel like it's kind of, you can't blame Ford because they're looking at the next year or two. <laughs> it's kind of hilarious because it's true. Very short term thinking. Now, look, I, I I roast these companies as legacy automotive companies constantly, Ford and GM in particular. But I actually don't really think the people leading these companies, maybe in the case of GM, that might be the exception, but at least for Ford, I think at least Jim Farley of Ford knows that Ford needs to urgently transition to electric vehicles or they'll go bankrupt. But the difficulty in having the courage and being able to get the approval from many other decision makers within a company to go all in on electric vehicles at Ford knowing that it's going to cost billions, tens of billions of dollars, and they're still likely to never be able to catch up to Tesla. It seems like the choice that companies like Ford and GM are faced with is, do you want to go bankrupt fast, aggressively transitioning towards EVs, or go bankrupt slowly, not even trying? I think Ford and GM are opting for the slowly by not even trying strategy. In case you missed it, the Tesla Model Y alone, so these are not Tesla vehicle sales combined, just the Model Y, a single product accounted for over 35% of all electric vehicles sold in the United States in the first quarter of 2024. If only Elon Musk hadn't been posting his thoughts on X, it would have been even higher. <laughs> I can't stop poking that bear. Jesus Christ, what a DMF. Anyway, at this point, I think Ford, GM, etc. are like, fuck bro, we can't compete with this thing on cost, on features, on functionality. Tesla's absolutely dominating us. We're not going to be able to catch up. So let's not even try. Moreover. The Tesla Model Y sales surpassed those of the next best-selling non-Tesla electric vehicle, so excluding the Model 3 S and X. The Ford mark -E by a factor of 10, a literal order of magnitude. And incredibly, it also outsold the combined sales of the next top 10 best-selling non-Tesla EVs. Again, outperforming by a literal order of magnitude. Is it any wonder companies like Ford and GM are like, fuck it, let's just let's not try, we give up. Wave the white flag. Let's just focus on the next couple of years, a golden parachutes, and then go bust quietly and slowly. I don't blame them. This is actually the rational decision. I'm not going to lie. I mean, would you want to be trying to compete with Tesla if you're an automotive company? Or SpaceX if you're an aerospace company? I sure fucking wouldn't. And they're going to, I mean, it's, they're just following their customers essentially and what they can offer them. And it's like they can't offer them a high quality, low cost, long range EV. I think that's become pretty clear. And so they're going to go hybrid. 
And I think hybrid's going to eat their gas powered vehicle sales. But more than that, you're going to have the pure play battery electric vehicles eating both hybrid and gas. So I think this is a short term move innovators dilemma esque type problem and a mistake to uh, focus on the short term. As in hybrid. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. So what was the, I think someone gave an analogy on brainstorming Friday about hybrid. Um, it's, do you remember it? I don't know. I don't want to butcher it. I mean, was I'll it, say, I'll say a couple of things. You tell me which, which one do you think it was? <laughs> yeah. Wait, there was one. It was it's, one like of, the, yeah. it's the worst of both worlds, right? You're taking yeah. a complicated system, you're adding another complicated system, and now you've got an even more complex system. So that's bad just generally speaking, and leads to higher maintenance costs. Um, the analogy that I made is I feel like this is a this is reminiscent of COVID and you had the traditional automakers cancel their semiconductor orders, which is, you know, apparently something that you never do. And then those factories shut down and reallocated to other providers. And then for the next two years on earnings calls, you heard them say, you know, we don't have the supply of semiconductors. And it was, it was because they made a knee jerk, short term oriented decision. And I think this is, you know, a replay of that. I think the analogy was it hybrid reminds, I forget who said this. So apologies on not giving proper credit here, but it would be, you know, the comparable to when the original combustion engine was created using that in conjunction with horses um, mm. and, you know, tying a horse to like an original combustion engine car and seeing if it, you know, helps performance in some way. Now, where have I heard that before? I've got a funny feeling. I remember somebody saying something along the lines of hybrid vehicles, like stapling a fucking horse to an automobile. I mean, it's a pretty obvious analogy. So I'm sure plenty of people have said things to that effect. It's just a dumb idea. This does really illustrate the insanity of hybrid electric vehicles, aka fake electric vehicles. They're just ice vehicles with unnecessary additional forms of propulsion included, adding complexity, cost, braking points, additional maintenance, overhead, etc. Totally insane idea. Short window of time, 15 years ago when they made sense. No longer today. Compelling long-range electric vehicles are now affordable. You can buy one for less than the average new price of a vehicle in the United States. Hybrids make zero sense. So as I've said, I believe what these legacy automotive companies are actually saying is, we're fucked. We're not even going to try with electric vehicles, but how about we dupe some of our brand loyal customers into buying ICE vehicles with a tiny little battery in them, make a little bit of money on those over the next few years, and then quietly ride off into the sunset, aka file for bankruptcy. Uh, obviously, it's not the proper solution over the long term. Did announce that they're going to unveil RoboTaxi on August 8th. What are your pre, predictions? Pre discussion. Yeah, well, well, or just your predict. Yeah, it, so, it's, it, it sounds like it's right. This is the platform on which a compact car or a RoboTaxi could be built. Mm hmm. So it sounds like there will be versatility. We also know that they're working on their un, quote, unboxed manufacturing process, mm -hmm. uh, which could be a part of this as well. And sounds like it likely will be. And I think we can, we can leave it there and dive in next week. So the guys at ARC are pretty delicate, but I think they are hinting fairly strongly that legacy automotive companies, especially in the US, may not be around <laughs> for too much longer, given the fact that they're slowing down regarding electric vehicles when the only way to have a shot at surviving long term would have been to go all in aggressively. Anyway, enjoy watching these folks dupe some of their customers into buying hybrids over the next few years, touting them as the future and superior and all sorts of other shit and then quietly <laughs> watching their ice sales collapse, their profits collapse, mass layoffs after mass layoffs after mass layoffs and then bankruptcy. Now there is there is a curveball case. It is possible. And I think that Jim Farley, at least at Ford, does have this trick up his sleeve. He is maybe thinking, you know what? If we can just survive the next couple of years until Tesla solved autonomy, maybe then we can agree to license the software, have generous revenue sharing so we can get fat profits by offering this to our customers on a monthly subscription. And then maybe we can start scaling up our EV production. EVs only available with Tesla FSD in them. Big value add to customers. And then we can just, instead of selling hybrids to our loyal customers, sell Tesla powered Ford vehicles to our customers and maybe survive at a much smaller scale than we previously peaked. I think maybe this is what Jim Farley is looking at at Ford, but you never know. I'm being pretty generous, but I certainly am sure that at least partially this is a plan, but maybe 
this is how he thinks the company survives. Scale back now, bad idea, but put all your eggs into the Tesla license FSD basket a few years from now. Just remember though, folks, hope is not a strategy. Want more content? Early access? Bunch of perks? Click the links in the pinned comment. AG1 has given me a massive, meaningful boost in energy, allowing me to do a lot more every day, including using my brain more and using my body more. I highly recommend you guys and girls check it out. It's an excellent way to fill in nutritional gaps. It's got 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, and whole food source nutrients, plus prebiotics and probiotics and digestive enzymes and adaptogens to help you deal with stress. Plus, if you click the link in the pinned comment or head to drinkag1.com SMR, you can get yourself a one-year free supply of vitamin D3 and K2. But don't take my word for it. Here's what some of you guys and girls have to say. AG1 has changed my life. I was, as you described, treating myself like a circus. I ate like trash, rarely exercised, used alcohol as a stress crutch, cannabis also. AG1 is what gave me the kick in the ass, got me back to the gym, motivated me to do more for myself, family, my business, etc. Keep doing what you do. Now, I know there's some skeptics, the same kind of people who think Elon Musk is a fraud reading this going, what do you thought? There's no way that's possible, bro. It must be a placebo effect. Believe it or not, this is a recurring theme. If you give your body everything it needs to feel and perform its best, including having a lot more energy, you'll need ways to use that energy. For me personally, that includes more exercise, moving my body more, more social activity, and more cognitively demanding tasks, including producing a ton of exclusive content over on Twitter and on Patreon, plus my daily YouTube uploads. The proof's in the pudding. On to another testimonial from a viewer of this channel. SMR, you asked me to provide feedback on AG1. Here it is. It has helped with mental acuity, stamina, and intestinal waste management. Uh, can't read between the lines. It certainly helps with regularity and digestion. That's what the digestive enzymes are for. It has also dramatically reduced my cravings for sugar. You guys need to stop eating sugar. It's fucking poison. I'm 50, 5'9", and overweight, aka a fat motherfucker. I think that's a technical term for overweight, isn't it? Is it fat motherfucker or obese? I can't remember. I average 100 hours a week in the West Texas oil fields as a safety supervisor. Jesus Christ, dude. No wonder you're struggling to keep your weight under control. 100 hours a week. Brutal. It has helped me lose weight. It is not an appetite suppressant. It can help fat people suppress cravings and motivation to be healthier is critical for changing your diet. Love you, brother. Again, this is a great point. It's something people really don't seem to grasp. If you have more energy, everything becomes easier. It's like turning on easy mode for life. A few years ago, before I was taking AG1, my health was trash. I was struggling to get through the day, had afternoon fatigue. The last thing I wanted to do was either use my brain or move my body. Didn't have the energy. Now, my biggest struggle every day is figuring out ways to use that energy. I'm exercising way more, doing a lot more with my friends and family, and of course, my work output has increased substantially. And you can fact check me. Check out the average length of my videos I was posting to YouTube three years ago. Need I say more? And one final testimonial. Love this one. Okay, here's the deal for me with this AG1 shit. I'm 41 years old and not the type to eat, drink, smoke, or sleep healthy, so I was skeptical. That being said, here's what I experienced. Day one, meh. Day two, afternoon fatigue was about 45 minutes late. Day three, zero afternoon fatigue. Day four, zero afternoon fatigue plus extra energy. Day five, again, zero afternoon fatigue plus energy. Wondering, what the f really? See, this is the thing, right? The results for many people are just almost too good to be true. This, this is the same experience I had. My afternoon fatigue just vanished out of nowhere. I'm like, wait, what the f Why am I not tired in the afternoons anymore? Surely, it's not that AG1, is it? Turns out it was. Day six and seven, same thing. Day eight, same thing. Plus, I had the want to get things done around the house that I normally would slack off and not get done. Again, the point, extra energy, you'll need to use it, you'll find ways to use it. Day 9, 10, and 11, and today is day 12. I fucking love it. So however you managed to get me to buy it, I'm so glad you did. Thank you so much, SMR. It really changed me so far. Guys, this shit really works. Just try it. By the way, this is the reason I continue to relentlessly promote AG1. A lot of people get real fucking mad in the comments. Oh my god, Snake Oil Salmon sold out. Oh my god, he's a scammer. This is fraud. But Constantly... I'm pretty sure everyone making these comments is also currently short Tesla stock. I'm not particularly concerned about people having a negative perception, those folks suffering from small brain syndrome, still living in my bum's basement syndrome, etc., writing mean comments, claiming AG1's a scam or it doesn't work. I mean, bro, when I get feedback like this, this is what keeps me going. Just try this stuff for a month, and if you don't get these results, get your money back. See, it's a literal no-brainer. It's an IQ test at this point in time. Testimonial after testimonial after testimonial like this. Get your money back if it doesn't work. Just try it for a month, and if it doesn't work... Get your money back. Today's the day. It's finally time. Be like this guy who was a massive skeptic, but finally, after a thousand promotions in a row, caved in, tried AG1, and has results like this. Head to drinkag1.com slash SMR, or click the link at the pinned comment, and please, let me know how you're feeling in a few weeks' time. Now, if you'll excuse me, 
Time to put my extra energy to good use. I'll be recording some more exclusive content for Patreon and my Twitter subscribers. So click the links to pin comment. See you over on Twitter and or Patreon. And don't forget to grab your AG1. Love ya.